Don't you love those kids? They sure can teach us a lot, can't they? I hope you, if you have your Bibles, you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And we are continuing in a series of sermons from the Sermon on the Mount, and more specifically right now in the Lord's Prayer. And I hope you've been uh, encouraged in your prayer life as we've walked through this, and as we've seen this pattern of prayer that the Lord has given to us. And it is a pattern prayer for our lives. It is not simply prayer, as we've said all along. It's not simply prayer to be re recited or repeated during, during worship, kind of mindlessly going through our Father and Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It, it is a pattern for our prayer life. And I, and I hope you see, we begin, our, our Father in heaven, we are praying to our Heavenly Father, and, and we pray that His name will be made great, that His, His name will will be hallowed, that His kingdom will come, His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that our King, that King Jesus right now will reign over all things in our lives and in the world around us. We see such a discrepancy between what God has intended and what is, and we pray, oh Lord, oh our Father, will you bring your kingdom on in heaven on earth as it is in heaven, in our lives as it is in heaven. And then last week, we talked about the fact that we, in our dependence upon Him, in an absolute dependence upon Him, we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And then today, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And then Jesus added some commentary couple of verses later, after he said those words, and he said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Those are some pretty heavy words right there at the end, right? And that we forgive as, as, as we have forgiven, that He forgives us as we have forgiven our debtors. And what I want us to see here today, very simply, very simple uh, gospel word to us, that we recognize the need to be forgiven and we recognize the need to forgive. That we realize how vital it is, not only that we revel in the forgiveness that God has showered upon us, but that we, that we also recognize the call to you and me to be as He is. When we are hurt, when we are offended by others. And let's just start. We, we, are, we are sinners in need of forgiveness. Simple point. We are sinners in need of forgiveness. Jesus is showing us that our most our, our deepest spiritual need is, is forgiveness. It is our, our deepest need before we come to Christ. And there is this ongoing need to be forgiven as we walk through our lives day in and day out. So we continue to pray that God will forgive us, that we are sinners in need of forgiveness. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, those familiar words from the prophet Isaiah who, who came into worship one day. You know, maybe like we came into worship today and, and, and you know, just another day, just another day, and he had this tremendous encounter with God. And he said that the Scripture tells us, he, or Isaiah tells us, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And he saw the glory of God, and he saw the, um, how, how great God is. And when he saw the greatness of God, he came to the realization who he was. In the, in the presence of a holy God. And He said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I have stood in the presence of a holy God, and now recognizing His holiness, I see the discrepancy between who He is and who I am, and I realize my great need before God. David, a man who is called in the Bible a man after God's own heart. And we know the story of David. And we know how he sinned. Not only adultery, but murder. Essentially murder. And David stood before God and he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. I, I realize that from the very beginning I have been a sinner. From the very beginning I, I, I'm a sinner. And, and he saw his great need before God. 
And, and, we, and, and we say, and at this point we say, well, I don't think I'm such a bad person. Somebody might say, I, I don't think I'm such a, a, a bad person. I've done a lot of good things in my life. But the Scripture tells us that all who rely on the works of the law, in other words, if you rely on your morality and your ability to somehow keep God's law, if somehow you can do that, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things. And that last phrase is the catch, right? All the things written in the book of the law. In James wrote, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of the law. In other words, if we were to say to, if you were to say today, well, I've never done so, you know, this this terrible thing and this terrible thing, but then I ask you, you know, all I have to do to kind of verify this is to say, have you ever told a lie? And and, and we say, and we don't have unless we're liars, <laughs> or maybe because we're liars, we might say, we might say, no, I've never told a lie, but we know that's not true, right? Every one of us knows. That, that we stand guilty before the law. And Jesus chained, Jesus wrapped it up when He said that not only have you, if you've, if you've never committed adultery, the actual act of adultery, but if you have looked with lust on someone in your heart, then you have committed adultery in your heart. Or if you look with hatred at someone, if you, if you have hatred towards someone, you have committed murder in your heart. And James goes on and he says, for, for he who said, I do not commit adultery, or do not commit adultery, also said, do not, do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. In other words, God doesn't take the law, take His law and say, okay, we've got this part, this part, this part, this part, this part. Even if you just take the Ten Commandments, we've got ten parts, and you say, well, I must get five points because I've never murdered anybody. But you deduct two points because I have told a lie. And I don't think a lie is quite as bad as murder, you know. So I'm three up, right? And I mean, yeah, I mean you go down through there and you start quantifying. No, you, do, you don't do that. You say, okay, I, I broke one law. That means I've broken the whole law. And I'm guilty before God for the whole law, liable to the whole law. I owe a debt to God. And because I owe a debt to God, that debt has to be paid. It is a debt. God is a just God. And the debt must be paid. And, and, and the Scripture says, if you, if you want to kind of sum it all up, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, if you want to just say it like this, God created us in His image to bear His image in the world and to glorify Him in the world. And none of us have fully lived up to that. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if that's the end of the story, this is pretty dismal day for all of us. But it's not the end of the story. And, 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 and that word in, in Romans 3, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. In other words, not in the keeping of the law, but apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is no distinction. For yes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Now I know that's Christianity 101. I know that many of you have, you know, you could almost recite some of those scriptures by heart. But, but it's important for us to be reminded that we are sinners in, in need of forgiveness. And it's especially important that we be reminded of this when we're up against a challenge to forgive somebody else. That we, and, 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 and here's the thing. Not only, not only have, has, you know, are we sinners in need of forgiveness, there's hope of forgiveness. Romans 3, we read just a moment ago that there's a righteousness of God that has been manifested apart from the law. 
the, 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 the Old Testament prophets foresaw this hope when they said, Who is God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of His inheritance? He does not retain His anger forever because He delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? I mean, don't, let, don't ever let yourself get where that doesn't ring the bell for you. You know, when it comes to your faith in Christ that we have been forgiven, that the way, yes, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go back to Galatians 3.13. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead to our tech folks up there. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That when they took Jesus Christ and they laid Him on the cross and they, they, they put nails in His hands and in His feet, He took the curse of sin. He took the curse of the law upon Himself and He died for you and for me there. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The curse of our sin, our law breaking, our debt. I mean, have you ever been in so, in, so much in debt you just scared the, the life out of you? Debt can be a curse. But think about it in the debt to God. You can never pay. That is the curse we're talking about here. And you're going to have to pay that, that, that debt. And the Scripture tells us the way that debt is paid for those who, apart from Christ is an eternity in hell. An eternity separated from God. But that, that debt has been paid. The curse of our sin, the curse of our law breaking, the curse of our debt was taken upon Jesus. He took it upon Himself. He bore the curse for you and for me that we might be set free from the debt. That, it might, that, that from the cross He might proclaim, it is finished. In other words, it is paid in full. The debt has been paid. There is hope of this in Jesus Christ. And so, we, we see that in, 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 in number three there, God is willing and wants to forgive our sin. That He is not, that he, he doesn't have to just made away. He is willing. He wants to forgive us our sin. That we, that we, we understand and we, we read uh, that, that in, in, in Romans 3 again, for all who believe there's no distinction, all who sin fall short of the glory of God are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward. Look at that. God made a way. The Scripture tells us He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That God is willing and wants to forgive our sins. Isaiah 53, God speaking through the prophet to His own people. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Aren't those beautiful words? And the prophet goes on in Isaiah 55, we read, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. He not only has made a way to forgive our sins, but he wants to forgive our sin. So that we who have come to him in Christ, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But when you come through Christ, that pardon that is sealed, that debt has been paid, He is just, the Scripture says. That means He won't charge you again for what has already been paid. That would be unjust. And what has been paid was paid by Christ on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. And so the debt has been paid. 
Think about it. Your sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we don't have to hide from God anymore. And we don't have to try to pretend. Or we don't have to try to think somehow that, that we can muster up enough to keep the law. We come to the, the realization that we have already broken the law, that we are already guilty. But the guilt was taken away from us and put on Christ if we come to God through Jesus Christ. Simple gospel word for you and for me. And so, for us, for those of us who know Christ as our Savior today, for those of us who have repented of our sins and turned to Him, the Scripture gives us this promise that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We don't have to hide anymore. We don't have to pretend I'm doing, I'm doing really good right now. We don't have to pretend, I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm, at least I'm doing better than he is, or I'm doing better than she is. If we say, if, if we say we have no sin, we are a liar, and the truth is not as we deceive ourselves. The truth is not as. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in the Lord's prayer, we pray, forgive us our debts. As we have forgiven those who have against whom we have debts, and, and and so there, there's that, that that promise here, that that promise that, that not only are we forgiven our past sins, but even that we in this ongoing process we continue to come to Him and we confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And we repent of our sin. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. We come to Him. We don't. We you know. We 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 recognize that the repentance that is is a wonderful thing, and we no longer have to try to hide. But instead, we confess our sin. That's a part of the Lord's prayer. That is to be a part of our lives day in and day out as we walk through this life. Just as much as give us. This day, our daily bread, we pray, forgive us our debts. Right? And, and it's an ongoing part of our prayer. Now, that, I mean, that's all good, and we all say hallelujah to that. I hope you are anyway, at least in your heart. I don't know some of you in your eyes are saying hallelujah, and some of you, I don't know. But, but anyway, you know, yeah, but, but here's the thing. We all love that part, and then, and then Jesus has to go and say, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that changes things a little bit, doesn't it? And then he adds that commentary for if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And we get a little catch in our throat. Because all of a sudden we think about that person who did that to us, Whatever that is, whoever that person may be, and we say, you mean him? You mean her? And all of a sudden, I, you know, it, it, it gets ramped up just a little bit, doesn't it? And he gets ramped up just a little bit for us. But here's the thing: forgiven people forgive. Forgiven people forgive. I, I, I read it again. In a, from a story by Robert Louis Stevenson from many, many years ago, of course. And Stevenson wrote about two sisters that lived in the same house. Of course, it was many years ago, and their living conditions were probably different from what we would think of today. But they, they lived in a house, and it was a one-room house. They lived in this one-room house, and everything they did, they did together in this one-room house. And they, they had a, a theological dispute one day. Now, it doesn't say what the theological dispute was about, but it must have been really something because they decided that they were never going to speak to each other again. And, and the statement says they lived in that same house the rest of their lives and never spoke to each other again. In fact, they took some chalk and they drew a line. Did anybody ever do that with their sibling? Now we used to, you know, the back seat, there were four of us, so one sat up front. That's when you had a bed seat up front and bigger, wider cars. And 
no seatbelts, by the way, at that time. And, and three of us in the back, and this is your space, this is your space, and this is my space. And if you were the biggest, you made your space bigger, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know, because you could do it. And, and you were bigger. And, and, and so, and, and you drew a line. There's this imaginary line. Well, these sisters took some chalk and they drew it right down the center of the room. You know, it was when they, they cooked on in a fireplace, so they split the fireplace. They went right down the fireplace and they had one room, one door out of the house and they split the exit door. And for the rest of their lives, neither of them stepped across the line. Not in word or in deed. And Stevenson said this. He said that, that they went to the same church together. They, they continued to go to the same church together and they would stand and at times in this church they would recite the Lord's Prayer. And Stevenson said, and I'll paraphrase, I don't think they meant it. I don't think they meant it. Because when you come to this part, Give us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And you just pray in kind of a cursory way. And it doesn't occur to you that there's somebody who has a debt, there's a debt that they owe you. And you aren't willing to forgive as you've been forgiven. All of us know somebody who holds on to grudges like it's the most valuable thing they have ever owned. No, don't, don't we? Hope it's not you. Hope it's not you. Hope you don't look at that person in the mirror every day. And, and it's, it's, once they, it's once it's decided in their mind that, that, that somebody has offended them, they will hold on to that offense for the rest of their lives. I, I heard about a, a father who was taking a dad who was taking his son with him one day and they were running some errands and they stopped by to pick up a prescription and, and the dad said to the person behind the counter, I came to get the, the prescription for my wife's, my wife's colitis. And, and, the, and, and the son who knew his mother well said, who's she colliding with now? And, and I mean, you, you know that you know somebody, it just seems like there's, there's a collision and, and it's, it's just that never ending. It never ends. And here's the truth. Everybody in this room has sinned against somebody. And, and it owes a debt to somebody. And everybody in this room has been sinned against and is owed a debt. And Jesus just very, very clearly here opens our eyes to the fact that the greatest debt of all is the debt we owe to our God. And that we are to forgive debts as our debts have been forgiven. And, and, and we who are of the kingdom of God are forgiven those debts, right? I mean, Revel in that. Rejoice in that. Don't ever let that grow old. You owe a debt to God. You owe a debt you can never, ever pay. You owe a debt that if, if God were not forgiving and willing and able and, 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 and not simply in theory, but in actuality willing to forgive our sin, that every single one of us in this room would be bound to pay that debt for all of eternity. Not just for a moment. Because that is the holiness of God. As Isaiah saw Him high and lifted up. That is the holiness of God and that is the wretchedness of us. And in contrast to that, we stand before Him and all like sheep having gone astray. But the Lord laid on Him that one cursed on that tree, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of the soul. And we revel in that, and we should. And please don't ever stop reveling in that. Please don't ever let that grow old. Please don't ever let that become passe in your life. Though you've heard it like I have since I was just a child, Jesus Christ died for my sins. 
May there always be in my spirit and yours a hallelujah when we hear those words. But as we revel in that, Jesus says that forgiven people forgive. That there is this transforming work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people like you and people like me. And that the Holy Spirit, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts and we are now empowered to forgive as we have been forgiven. That's a miracle, folks. That's not the way of the world. The world's way is, is vengeful. The world's way is, is retribution. Many of us were taught that. Even in Christian homes, we were taught if somebody does something to you, don't ever forget it. And maybe you weren't taught it in so many words, but you were taught it by example. Because you saw that. And that's how you got it in your mind. This is how we do it. And Jesus says, no, no, it's not. It, it is not the way we do it. Not kingdom people. Not children of the Father in heaven. This is not how we do it. Instead, we forgive as we've been forgiven. And, and it's important here that we understand that we're not made right with God by forgiving others. We are justified by grace through faith alone. But we are a, a fundamentally transformed people. And these fundamentally transformed people like you and like me forgive as we've been forgiven. And, and, and here's the thing. An unforgiving person needs to take careful inventory of their lives to be sure they're in the faith. And we can say this is a terrible word. In fact, Augustine, one of the early church fathers, said this is a terrible word for us. But I think not. I think it's a wonderful word. It's a wonderful word because it reminds us that it, it, it is a test for us. It helps us to gauge where we are in the faith. The Apostle Paul said, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do, do you not realize this about yourself? That Jesus Christ is in you. Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. And you know what one of the questions on the test is? Did you forgive like you were forgiven? Because to not do so is a denial of the very work of Christ that has taken place in you and in me. Jesus said this, pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive him. I but what if he doesn't repent? I got it. I got her. She didn't repent. You know what? If you don't forgive, it's on you. And it's always going to be on you. And it's always going to be in you. And it's going to turn into something, turn you into something you don't want to be. I forget who it was, but I remember hearing somebody a while back say that your face defines who you are by the time you're 40. You ever seen somebody that just wouldn't forgive? I mean, just held on to grudges. It changes the way you look. We call it bitterness. And you see it. And you see it not only in the face, but you see it in their other relationships as it bleeds over into the other relationships. And the very best relationships of our lives get spoiled by the very worst relationships in our lives. Because you can't separate yourself out. The thing is, you become, you become that. You become that. This is why God's word says so simply that we are forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. Now, let me very quickly say, I'm not referring here to somebody who's been offended and you're trying to forgive. And you know in your heart, now don't play games with yourself here. You're struggling. I tell you, forgiving sometimes is a fight, isn't it? Let's just admit, it's a fight. I don't care how close you walk with God. I don't care if there's, there's part of that, that flesh in us 
that, that wants to hold on and you say, I've forgiven and I'm moving on. And then you wake up the next morning and it's like it rushes up to you and shakes your hand again. Right? That very same thing that person did to you way back when. And it has a way of just kind of coming back again and again and again. And, and you know what you do when it happens? When that happens? You say, oh, no. I distinctly remember forgiving that. I distinctly remember forgiving me. And I'm not going to carry that forward anymore. I don't know about you, but there have been some things in my life, kind of people who betrayed, people who hurt, that sort of thing. And, and I, I, you know, I, I, I establish in my mind I'm going to forgive you and I move forward. And then there's just this day I'm thinking about a thousand other things and it comes up and it's like a mad dog that just sneaked up on me and bites me. And, 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 and there it is again. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about when you have established in your mind, I'm going to forgive, and I, I by God's grace, I'm forgiving this. And, and it comes back, and you struggle with it. Keep fighting. All I can say to you, keep fighting the good fight. Don't give up. And don't give in. And don't let unforgiveness do what forgiveness will do to you if you're unwilling to forgive. And I, and I say this too. I'm not talking about someone who's recently had something happen to you. In fact, so recent that you're barely even able to catch your breath right now. I mean, there are those times in life when something happens and somebody does something and it just almost takes your breath away. And it takes a while to even figure out how to breathe again. But I would say to you right at the very start, establish, I will by God's grace, forgive. I will, by the grace of God, forgive. The spiritual health is measured by this, folks. At the very least, spiritual health is measured by this. And I would say this for a person who says, I, I'm going to hold on to grudge, I'm going to hold on to it, I'm going to hold on to it, I'm going to hold on to it. Jesus is saying, I do believe. That little boy got it right right up here. He said, you're not a Christian. And only you and God know that. And I can't establish that. But I can tell you, one thing that tests our faith is this. Do you have it in you to forgive when you've been offended by somebody else? The thing about it is, our quickness to take offense and hold on to offense begins to affect not just the moment, but, but our, our, our future. And it snowballs. And you know what? A person who, who lets offense stay around gets offended all the more easily, right? So that you, you, the heaven, and when you pray then, you go, you go to the Lord in prayer, and it seems like the heavens, as they say, are brass. The heavens are hard. And you try to pray and you wonder why. Does it seem like I'm not being hurt? And Jesus is saying, forgive like you've been forgiven. And when you forgive, you are so much like Jesus. And, and, and we say, you are, you are never more like God than when you forgive. Forgiveness originates in heaven. We say to err is human and to forgive is divine. divine. To, 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 to forgive is like God. But, but if we say that, if to forgive is divine, then what does that make unforgiveness? Demonic? Of the world? Of our defeated enemy? Spiritually healthy people. And you might have to fight. But spiritually healthy people forgive. And spiritually healthy people make healthy churches. So that there's this, this continuing process of forgiving. Jesus said spiritually healthy people do like this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him your fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. And you want that. You don't want that rift between you and this other person. And so you seek forgiveness. And to forgive. Peter came up to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often must I forgive? And spiritually healthy people don't just say, Lord, you know, can I, 
give me a quality, give me a quantity here. Give me a give me a, a, a number. Spiritually healthy people. Jesus said, you don't forgive seven times, you forgive seventy-seven times. What did he say? As many times as it takes. When it comes back to the surface again, you forgive. And it comes back again and you forgive. And it comes back again. And they may even do it again. And what do you do? You forgive. And it's important that we understand that forgiveness and trust are not always the same thing. There are people who will do awful things. And, and there's a point at which you have to pull away. And you have to be very careful with that person. When it comes to abuse or something like that, you you know you don't just you don't just you know put your money out there in front of somebody who's already robbed you. You know, you, so spiritually healthy people forgive, and spiritually healthy people though realize you know as many times as it takes, as many times as it takes, forgiveness and trust are not always the same thing. In Matthew chapter 18, that story that I shared with the children just a few moments ago. That, that story that, that where, where Jesus said a man owed so much money to his master that he could never pay him. And, and, he, and, he, and, he, tried, and, and he, he went to his master who was requiring of him the payment of the debt. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'll pay it back. But he couldn't. There was no way he could pay it back. That's you and me. And that master is God. And there's no way we could ever pay it back. There's no way. So why would we turn like this wicked servant, as Jesus calls him? Why would we turn and require one another a debt that is so minuscule compared to the debt that we owe to God? We forgive because it is in the character of Christ. And we forgive because it follows the example of Christ. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And, and 1 John 2 says, By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says he abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Many of us were taught retribution is the way we live. But Jesus teaches us, forgive as you've been forgiven.